Good evening, everyone. Nice to see all of you here tonight. Um, my name is Björn Allemark, and I um, direct the public program of uh, events here at KT School of Architecture. Um, and throughout the past year or so, we've been sort of uh, having a, an interest in the link between architecture and architectural pedagogy and architectural spaces for pedagogy and spaces um, uh, sort of uh, overlapping all of those interests in the series uh, Learning Environments and the New School. Um, and tonight's speaker was uh, uh, on the list really early on for people to invite on this topic, so we're really glad to have him here tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, the reason why we have this interest is um, what you see around you, the new School of Architecture here at KTH, and the sort of new conditions for learning and teaching architecture um, that moving into a new building brings with it. Um, and uh, OMA's New York office has uh, designed the Milstein Hall for a Cornell AAP in uh, upstate New York, and that's the project that we asked Shohei to present in uh, depth and detail. Um, but um, the question of architectural pedagogy and teaching and learning architecture is of course also um, something that OMA as a practice uh, has developed um, a kind of own uh, model for in a sense. It's, uh, I'm sure there's, uh, or I've seen several uh, OMA alumni in the in the audience, and um, perhaps um, Shohei will also talk something about uh, the way that uh, architecture is taught at the office. Um, and uh, Shohei Shigematsu is also teaching a studio at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, so, yeah. The, there's all kinds of uh, reasons why we invited you, and we're really happy to have you here tonight. So please, uh, the floor is yours, Shohei Shigematsu of OMA, New York. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, it's always nice to be in Stockholm. Um, as, as he just said, I just brought the students two years ago from Harvard to Sweden. Uh, that's the research topic that I'm conducting there uh, at Harvard is uh, called Alimentary Design, which is uh, to investigate the uh, um, issue uh, in architecture and urbanism rela in relation to food and food production. And when I was here with students, I was really surprised or pleasantly surprised how Sweden manages to put uh, food also part of the creative industry and how uh, architecture and design was integrated to the food and uh, we, we had a lot of fun as always. Um, it's also a secret where I'm not allowed to tell but actually we did a store for H&M a uh, while ago which we are not allowed to show because it got cancelled. So uh, I was here quite often uh, and this is my one of my favorite cities in Europe. Um, it's it's a luxury, and it's also difficult to show only one project uh, in the lecture. But it's it's actually quite a a, a story here. So I hope uh, you enjoy the story rather than just looking into a kind of architecture. Um, so I will start. Um, I was in China, I was working mainly in China from early 2000 to 2000, maybe four, uh, when I decided to move to United States to take over the office uh, in New York City. And I was a little bit tired of just chasing uh, locations such as China or Middle East where the kind of booming happens. and. You know, it's very nice to witness the modernization and the power of modernization in such big countries or regions. But at the same time, coming from Japan, also in Japanese kind of second generation after the war, who experienced a lot of recessions 
and refinements, uh, somehow I started to miss uh, smaller projects or something a little bit more complex or cultured compared to those uh, booming countries. So this was the first project that uh, I did in the United States uh, after I took over the office. Um, this is the kind of interesting diagram of how architects' role is in such a kind of history, uh, the kind of process of uh, making a architecture school. Um, this is Oma. Uh, it's quite rare that uh, we are the third architects. At actually, that Stephen Hall won the competition, and then after that, that Barco and Leibinger took over. Uh, and this is showing the presidents and provosts and all these kind of key people uh, changing. And we were the third architects. Uh, as you know, we are quite well known as a starter, but being canceled and someone takes over our project. So it was kind of rare moment that we were the third architect. And I think that was that contributed to, in the end, to execute our quite a radical scheme because it was a third and they really had to finish. Uh, it's also ironical that we were the only entity that stayed consistent uh, during the entire process. As you can see, the president changed, the provost changed, the, AA, the dean changed, etc. So somehow it's irony that architects became the, wit the kind of, you know, the, the guru of this project, uh, and these people are somehow dependent on architects' knowledge and the history of this project. Also went through a lot of crises, uh, of uh, uh, economical crises. So there are a lot of uh, uh, s uh, pause in the project. So it, it's only like 5,000 square meter project, uh, but um, it's, it took like six years. Uh, so these were the two projects, Stephen Hall one and Barco and Leibinger. Stephen Hall was basically demolishing, well, both of them are demolishing a uh, a building called RAND, which is a kind of uh, studio building that has been used uh, since the beginning of the faculty. So there are a lot of love, uh, but uh, because of these demolishing that building, there are a lot of oppositions. Um, hence, that we were the third architect. I mean, as I said, we were well known as a starter. Uh, this was a Whitney project that I did before Cornell, which we were the second after Michael Graves to redo, uh, to add the uh, building to Whitney Museum. But in the end, uh, Renzo Piano took over, and as you know, they even moved currently the building from Upper East Side and donated, gave this Breuer building to Metropolitan Museum of Art, and then now they made a new building in downtown. But anyway, what I wanted to say is that it's rare that we were the third architect, because we, there is even a conspiracy theory that in architecture field, in very limited amount of people, that uh, uh, OMA and Renzo Piano is the same office, uh, because we always start and they always take over. Um, when we started um, the project, this is how it was. Uh, it's quite important to understand. So this was a Rand Hall, as I said, the building that was demolished by Stephen Hall, or the Stephen Hall and Barco was going to demolish. Um, so their AAP is architecture, uh, art, and planning. So art building is here. Planning is this wing. This is the library wing. This is the uh, sculpture wing. And this was architecture studio. And the the central administration was under this dome. So although they, you know, say this is interdisciplinary study, uh, faculty, because the buildings are so uh, uh, separate, they kind of hated each other. So that was the first uh, issue. The second issue is that, as you can see, this main building actually faces the uh, famous art squad. This is a kind of very typical American campus uh, scene with the landscape connecting all the dorms and main classrooms. Uh, but uh, these buildings didn't. Uh, and also, as you can see, the kind of common public space for the AAP was rather not here, but rather here, but which was quite neglected like this, like a parking lot with a bunch of uh, temporary uh, rooms. Uh, one another challenge was that you can't see it here, but um, 
there was they built the uh, entire dormitory complex on this side so basically a lot of students came from this bridge every day to enter the campus so suddenly this uh, shabby kind of studio building is the first became the first building that students would see so this is this became suddenly a kind of gateway a very charged uh, location uh, for the entire university uh, so this is the view when you come in uh, after the bridge so you see that sculpture studio that's the uh, library wing this is a uh, studio I show you the whole process because often uh, when OMA makes a presentation it always looks very kind of uh, um, clear and made it as if we were very determined to pursue that scheme from the very beginning but uh, of course we do a lot of uh, studies um, so this is a massing study because the one tricky pro thing about this project was that we were asked to keep all the buildings but the site was not really defined they, we had to find the site ourselves so this is the kind of uh, uh, a predictable scheme to make a kind of uh, aligned building a tower maybe like here it's probably too radical of course the all these buildings were uh, under the historical preservation, so you couldn't really change, alter the uh, exterior, nor you couldn't overwhelm them like this. This was adding a kind of central piece uh, towards the gorge. This is a kind of also one thing that we wanted to challenge. This is a kind of uh, man-made uh, nature. This they had the gorge which is a canyon that is of course not man-made and it was kind of under uh, appreciated although they have a full frontage to the canyon so we wanted to make this building redirect the attention towards this side and I'm showing you this uh, these are what we do in the studio is that we the team starts investigation like this and then we you know, sent to uh, um, the leaders, or we do this kind of internal kind of photography so that we can assess uh, internally first. And by the time we do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, back and forth, and uh, by the time there is a consensus made in the studio, in the, in the office, you can actually uh, almost ready to present to the client. So I think this kind of internal, um, design process is quite important uh, for our outcome. This was an interesting scheme that there was one square plot between this wing and uh, um, the studio building and then basically connecting those because before that they had to go outside and get into the main building. So this is to create a kind of uh, a connection and also this is an IMP 60s lib uh, museum, so we thought we could kind of echo this kind of tower at the corner. I, th I don't know why, well, I think in the end, we will sh you will see, but we, we were in the end not so sure about the vertical studio building. As you can see here, I don't know what you think about using a vertical building for ar architecture education, but uh, because uh, you know US or this campus had a lot of space we thought it was a little bit strange to make a tower although I, I kind of really like this scheme because it, it addressed issue of the gateway bu gateway building without demolishing this building this is another axis uh, that has a lot of uh, circulation so it's at the terminus of that axis and also connecting these two buildings so this is reducing those volumes to two. This is creating a deliberate kind of circulation. This was like a cross that uh, sits, again, connecting the studio building to the existing building. This was, I don't know, ski slope. Um, obviously not. Uh, so this is kind of close to the um, final scheme where we thought we could actually uh, connect these three buildings uh, and also 
make it very low to respect the uh, existing buildings, but also to create one space that the studio can fit uh, without having uh, multiple floors. So in the end, what we did uh, f uh, was to define the building footprint by existing lines. So you can see this, the pink is the, the footprint of the final building, uh, which is all defined by the kind of existing lines of the buildings. So it's almost like a found uh, building site rather than a kind of deliberate architectural site. So it has a kind of very weird moments, which I will show you later. Uh, so this we thought also as a, a means to connect different uh, uh, departments of the faculty, as I said, because because of the dispersal of the buildings, they didn't really interact. So we wanted to make a single space where people can interact, almost like a count kind of alternative to the art squad, but the interior and uh, big space where you can actually change over time. Uh, almost like a crown hall uh, by me in IIT, but lifted. So this is a kind of architecture. You can see what we decided. Because it's all defined by existing lines, um, you have this kind of moment where the entire inter internal facade is facing existing building. This is touching, so this is like hugging. And this is uh, not really uh, attached, but uh, kind of very close and uh, related to the um, exact length. Uh, but the activity actually continues throughout the building. Uh, also, this was a adaptive reuse uh, project, so we had to rethink and redo the interiors of the uh, existing buildings. Also, um, we had to show the vision of the uh, future of AAP, which I hope they will follow. Um, they, of course, this was the money was coming from architecture, so they had to politically also show that in the future planning department and also art department can equally uh, extend in the future. So this was an architecture extension which connected the architecture studio to the library. Uh, so we, we said uh, maybe we can make a continuous uh, kind of landscape that is hinged by the uh, new building towards the, uh, this side so that each program can actually extend uh, to this band sharing the parking space because uh, there is a severe lack of parking space also in the northern campus here. So we had to show how that uh, kind of continuous landscape will be. Uh, and that informed actually the design of the final design of the Milstein Hall itself. But the idea was that there is an underground parking that connects all the buildings uh, and then create a, a kind of continuous public space that houses the uh, extension as well. So this is the entire uh, section of the, this is, th yeah, looking south, and this is the Milstein Hall, and this is the extension of the planning, extension of the art, and even the extension of the museum, which actually happened uh, uh, according to our master plan. So it's always also architecture in this kind of a campus project, not just our building was important, but the vision for the future extension was very important. Um, this, stud, this plate, what we call upper plate, is uh, not that big. It's about like 60 meter uh, square. Um, so we've, we, of course, started to compare to other academic buildings, but this was as big as it gets uh, in this site. And we, what's interesting about the uh, investigation on this kind of plate, um, these are the kind of studies. So here you can still see that uh, we were a little bit interested in uh, more formally kind of uh, exciting thing, not just a floating box, but something a little bit more sectional. Um, I think we have to also mention that, that was this was 2005, and a lot of people were still very interested in very iconic buildings at the time. So just showing a plate, we thought it was a little bit too uh, calm. 
uh, as, a, as an office like us. So we were a little bit kind of ambivalent about whether being very straightforward or being formal a little bit. Um, there are a lot of other programs that didn't fit in single. The ideal was that uh, every program could fit into the single uh, plate, uh, but of course it didn't. So there are a lot of access programs like Auditorium and some library stacks that didn't fit. So you s what you see here is the, those things coming out of the uh, plate. Like this is a kind of two levels stacked or like a typical OMA with a kind of continuous space. Um, what was also interesting uh, during this process was that because the plate was a single space, uh, probably as an architect, it's very hard to be engaged uh, in the pedagogical part of uh, educa uh, pedagogical part of the uh, university planning, but because it was a single space and open-ended space, we were heavily involved uh, discussing with professors of the future education, educational potential. So at that time, we were moving the library to the new building, which in the end it, they did they decided not to because of the load issue. Uh, but this was showing how library stacks which used to be here is out because the library current library was very inefficient because the building structure was very old so that it couldn't hold as many books as they wanted to so this was to consolidate the book stacks into the new building and liberate this as a studio in the end they decided to move the library to this um, um, studio building and move entire studio here so it was a reshuffling occurred so as you can see, because there are a lot of uh, um, potential in such a single space, so we did a lot of uh, basically planning and also discussing with professors. For example, this side is the interdisciplinary side. This is the architecture side that could meet in the center. Uh, or this is more like a CAD CAM where with more like a technologically advanced part uh, with raised floor, and this is a typical studio, etc. So also, uh, I was talking uh, earlier how the decision-making process was, but it was quite an elaborate group of people that we had to present to. So we go there one day and present to like six different groups uh, from each department, and there's an executive committee, and there's also a student committee. Uh, there's also a user group, like uh, you know, in US, the kind of equality, it's like a, a virtue, so you have to present to all the kind of uh, um, administrative people. So it was a quite an elaborate process because, of course, admin people wants the best office uh, space, and the student wants the best facility, and I don't know what, like a lot of different groups have different uh, the priorities. So these are still continuation of how we uh, thought how the student, the, the, the layouts and the pedagogy could be rearranged. Uh, so once we provided the space, uh, and this was the kind of occupation currently, Um, I will explain to you the trust later, but uh, this is a kind of trust where, you know, of course, peop students are very good at start using things unexpectedly. Uh, so they started to hang the kind of uh, um, presentation um, panels from the from the trust. This guy immediately invented a hammock uh, using the angle of the trust. I mean, they. I don't know if you can do this here. Um, it has enough ceiling to do this uh, badminton, um, or it's such a big space that they have to use some mobility. 
Um, this, uh, this is a l uh, possible, made it possible through the kind of our thinking that the, the, the plate has a, such a contrast between the ceiling and the floor. Basically, ceiling has all the kind of infrastructure, uh, basically starting from the air distribution, cooling, um, lighting, and also data, electricity, everything is coordinated uh, as a kind of single plate. So on the floor, it's just the radiant heating, it's because it's just cold, but uh, that's it. And even electricity, the, the you have red dots, but it, it was decided that it only six or something like that got left. So even electricity uh, came from the ceiling. So this was a kind of coordination drawing of this, that package, which was quite intense because a lot of penetrations through the structure to accommodate those infrastructure. So you can see the contrast between very primitive floor and the, uh, well, seemingly high-tech uh, ceiling. So we thought that uh, architecture, art, education will change drama dramatically in the future, that we had to ensure the flexibility of the floor and basically facilitation wherever the, you know, whatever happens, the ceiling can basically drop uh, whatever they need to. Um, structure, we showed you the trust, but um, I can, there was also a story here. In the beginning, we wanted to provide such, of course, the most flexible space like this with just columns. Uh, but because we were going over the existing road here, this is existing city-owned road, uh, we couldn't, uh, of course, just lift the building as, uh, as like a crown hall did, like a, with a simple uh, columns. So we had to use trusses. Uh, our first approach was, we call it portal, so uh, above, around the street, basically we made a series of basically tables, like a portals, that made the structure of the plate very simple and kind of uh, flexible. But this became a, such a kind of um, issue of um, um, safety, because you can just basically create a lot of blind so spot for the, for the pedestrians, like this. So it got decided to uh, cancel. It was a big decision because university knew that in order to cantilever this, it's about 15 meter cantilever, uh, they had to spend more money. So this was a scheme. It was a kind of interesting uh, again, this was maybe didn't happen if we were not the third architect because university could have just said, why don't you chop the building and redesign? But because the time was so precious, they decided to continue this design and improve the structure to cantilever the entire building. So we started to look into the possibility of cantilevers. These are all Virendale, just uh, humongously expensive. This is all trusses around the perimeter only, but you create this kind of dead space around the perimeter. Uh, this is close to the end. Anyway, a lot of studies. Uh, we even thought that maybe the, not the portals, but you, you create this kind of truss structure in the center of the road. Uh, in the end, like we did so many studies that uh, we have to make our own shelves for, for the studies. But anyway, um, in the end, uh, this is the kind of amount of cantilever that spans over the road, about 15 meters. And as you can see, it's quite dramatic. And we, to utilize such a move, we actually placed the bus stop here so that the bus, people who wait the bus can basically uh, prevent being wet during the winter. Um, this is the winter. And of course, there's some, it's not, it's not really attached to this sculpture studio, but there's some kind of relationship as you can see. Um, 
what we did also to the trust was kind of interesting, reflecting the usage of the space itself. So the, the Virendale Trust, if you use Virendale all, all everywhere, it's going to be very expensive. If you use a conventional trust, you can see, as you can see, it prevents the kind of circulation to happen uh, and create a lot of dead spaces underneath the beams. So we decided to look more carefully into how the space will be used and also the moment, basically the uh, str uh, stress diagram. So we looked at the central space where you have more permeation between different zones. We decided to keep Virendale structure. Also, that's, th that's where the lowest uh, load is. And where the load is gets higher, we decided to move, uh, uh, deform, or change the Virendale gradually to the truss structure. So you can see the kind of gradation from straight to the angled. So basically, the students can actually you know, visualize this is visualizing the, st uh, the stress, so if students can really understand this, the, uh, the moment of the uh, building. It was fabricated in Canada. So you can see how the cantilever, this is a, the other side, which also cantilevers. Uh, you can see how straight gradually becomes a truss. And this is over the road, also straight uh, becoming truss. Because the building is defined by the existing lines, you can have this kind of very weird moment when this is so-called the gateway view, when students come from the bridge from the dormitory district. So you see the new building spanning uh, um, behind the existing building and kind of mysteriously hovering without any columns. Um, this is also a study uh, that was quite important. Uh, there was a one uh, moment that this tiny facade uh, had some visual uh, visibility to the art squad, which is like a kind of holy space, so you can't have anything new. Uh, but you see a little bit here, so we had to study how this facade should be. Uh, basically, Conrad, who is here, was also doing this uh, over and over again uh, because it was such a sensitive issue. Uh, so this was to create a kind of solid facade that continues the existing window. This, why, I don't know, but extending in just to provoke them. Sometimes you show more radical options, uh, some semi-radical options seeming the kind of not radical, so we often show very radical scheme uh, just to disguise the kind of semi-radical scheme. Um, this was like a directed window, like a Whitney window, sort of like a peeled. Uh, in the end, this was a kind of final solution just to recess. It's kind of boring because you show something interesting. I think this was Conrad's idea to basically kind of build this until this line and this cornice actually kind of carves out the stone, a very subtle, kind of very maniac kind of detail, um, which unfortunately, I liked it, but which unfortunately couldn't get realized. Uh, I think we like this one the most to make this top bar recessed or angled so that you create the balcony to face the um, art squad, but we didn't have enough budget. So in the end, it was just a straight facade. Um, so this uh, fascia of the plate is actually, uh, uh, this is marble. This is not art artificial. It's the way they cut. They create this kind of almost like a barcode-like lines. So the signage was also integrated to that uh, b vertical lines. So you can see kind of subtle signage. Uh, there is another element which we call dome, which is intersecting the upper plate, which is part of that uh, whole master plan we did. It's like more related to the parking and the kind of sequence of landscape for the future. Of course, that wasn't that didn't come too easy, so we studied a lot. We always knew some it should be something more related to the landscape, but. 
was kind of a kind of pit in the uh, plate, so that uh, creates kind of reverse dome. In the end, what we decided is to also, again, create another focal point, which is not this kind of traditional dome, but uh, a landscape dome. Uh, that does uh, all everything that we needed to do with a single move. Uh, so that was a very strong line. Uh, so uh, access from the ground up to the plate, and the old one program that was missing was auditorium. So auditorium will be placed on the uh, mound. And below that uh, uh, dome, we needed more crit space, like critique space. So that was provided. So in the end, this was a kind of section. So you can see uh, this is the access into the upper plate. This is the auditorium. And this is a critique space underneath. And the dome didn't really fit perfectly to the uh, confined site. So we cut the dome so that from the uh, bus stop, you can actually look down to the crit space, which I'll show you later. So this is the dome intersecting um, the upper plate. And that's the cut part where the bus stop is. So you can see the kind of completely different world between the steel structure and concrete structure. That was also our intention to provide main two techniques for the students to experience. The one is steel and one is uh, concrete. The dome extends uh, over like this so because, because it's such a landscape uh, like shape. So the facade does the traditional type of facade uh, is intersecting that uh, landscape, providing this kind of casual open space. And this is, again, the cut part on the street side where the bus stop is. The, the, the construction sequence was also very, uh, there was a big contrast to the steel erection because steel was such a organized and fast erection. Concrete was such a difficult process. As you, can, as you might know in US, concrete is still not really known as a final layer. Uh, it's known as a kind of structure that you extend extensively cover and clad afterwards. So there are a lot, not so many um, good contractors that can do a good concrete. So this is a dome, every three feet, so every like uh, 90 centimeter, we made this kind of guidelines. We put three layers of plywood so that it becomes ultra smooth because we knew that we couldn't demolish after we, no matter what the quality is because of the construction schedule and so on, we couldn't demolish. So we did of course a lot of tests, but this was one shot. So we, and then one night we uh, cast the concrete in 24 hours with uh, four trucks, concrete trucks. So you can see how the, the process itself is very different to the steel. Of course, it's a common sense, but it was very nice to witness the contrast. Uh, this is that uh, casual uh, auditorium. Um, this was a covered uh, exterior space which was heavily um, criticized during the design process. They really desperately wanted to get rid of this space, but we insisted that, you know, in such a kind of campus, of course, this kind of covered exterior space could be somewhat depressing in such a cold climate, but we thought that the campus lacks this kind of urban uh, area that students can invent uh, and bring some activities of them their own. So immediately, the, you know, after you know, even this was even before the opening. Uh, suddenly, the kind of urban activity started around this building, and uh, we had to politely kind of uh, seize them because we didn't even take picture of the building at that point. So this when they started skating. Um, and, you know, despite of their criticism or worry, uh, the space is actually quite frequently used. 
uh, we did also, of course, when there is such a kind of anxiety from the client, we, it's not like we just insist, but we do certain effort to kind of address the issue. Um, this is a ceiling pattern, which um, is the motif, is this kind of typical American tin ceiling, which is a very cheap cladding material, which of course is often used for the interior. So in order to give a sense of interior, uh, even though it was a covered exterior, we decided to use this uh, pattern to make the pe make people feel a little bit more like interior. But if you use a typical tin, which is about uh, 30 by 30 centimeter, it's going to be too small and too busy. So we oversized it uh, like this, about 1.2 meters, and pressed. Uh, uh, it was so big that only car manufacturer in Detroit could press, uh, and we pressed it. So you, you see some sense of continuity from inside to outside, and hopefully give some sense of uh, interiorness, even if you're in the exterior space. Um, this is a section of the auditorium, which is quite interesting. So you can actually go in from the studio, go down to the auditorium, it's hard to see here, but when you come to the lobby of the other side of the dome, there's a bridge that takes you to the middle part of the uh, middle height of the auditorium. And you can, of course, go down to the B1 level and enter. So you can enter to the auditorium from three different levels. So this is from upper plate going down to the auditorium. And in order to do that, we had to open this kind of uh, uh, mouth. And above that mouth, there is a small auditorium that could be used for the um, upper plate. So this is a concrete dome. This is an auditorium. And this is a final outcome. So you can see, um, the, the basically, the auditorium sits on the dome and go down. And this is a kind of image that we all, uh, liked and intended, that this is a triple glazing, although the car passes by because of the triple glazing, you don't hear anything. And thanks to the plate above, there's a certain darkness always preserved for the space, so you can actually project quite well without closing the curtain. So you can actually see the uh, landscape around, quite, which is quite beautiful, and also some movement of the cars uh, while you're uh, giving a lecture. So it's a little bit uh, immersed in the landscape, so which we like as a quality of the auditorium, which is not too closed. So you can see the cars passing by. This is the uh, opening. There's a small balcony. This is the main donor, uh, Howard Milstein, uh, which I'm going to tell you a small story which is uh, uh, evolved around this space. Howard Milstein, this, as, you s as you saw in the beginning, this project went through the credit crisis. So it what there was a pause for almost a year because the universe all entire university in the United States stopped construction because of the because they were losing the endowment of the the school but uh, Howard uh, liked this auditorium so much of course at that time it wasn't really constructed but he was the head of the board of trustees for the entire university and he wanted to show his uh, credibility by making this space not only for architecture auditorium, but for the uh, as a boardroom for the entire university, so they, he he told the university that if you can change because this this, uh, this space was already quite designed and it was already CD faced, it was quite difficult to change it into a boardroom. But he told the school and us that if we can change this space co uh, successfully to the uh, boardroom, he will pay more money to go through this credit crisis. So it was a very difficult moment, and we had to do it to uh, continue this project. The boardroom they were using was very kind of traditional or typical or even unpleasant. It's kind of a shell-shaped uh, auditorium with uh, a lot of rows. So if you're sitting here, it's very hard to go out, uh, etc. Uh, we thought uh, th we thought we had we we had to make this uh, auditorium quite uh, 
interesting to convince Howard to pay. So we looked into a kind of different types of seating uh, at the time. And also, as you might know, the, the board meeting is quite um, special. Like you have to have an electric vo uh, vote system and also you have to have the, your own monitor. It's a kind of a little bit uh, like business class seats. So we thought that uh, instead of having a kind of row of seats, we would provide a kind of first class business class seats for the each board to acknowledge their each individual achievement. Because as you can imagine, the board of such a university is all quite uh, successful people. So this is the end. So this is kind of swivel chair that has electric voting system and their own monitor and microphone embedded in each uh, seat. Um, so this is a typical configuration, but you can also do this kind of configuration to make a kind of central uh, uh, discussion. So the swivel, the swiveling the chair was quite important. But there was one problem that uh, this board, board meeting only happens twice a year. So this was, uh, as, as, you can, as you know, this is the architecture auditorium. So we didn't want to, of course, sacrifice the entire space just for the board meeting that happens twice a year. So uh, what we decided, uh, which we found a system in Spain uh, that can actually uh, mechanically uh, f uh, embed the chairs uh, to the floor which we thought it was a kind of interesting, uh, ironic uh, thing that uh, kind of the ghost or the zombie of the boards actually suddenly appears two times a year. I show you the how the system is. So you can actually individually uh, put this on the floor. So you can imagine like two times a year, like the zombie kind of appears and they discuss about the future of the university. <coughs> so of course, uh, this is like twice a year, but in, of course throughout the year it's like a flat space where you can actually put the flexible chairs. So that was our solution that went through the credit crisis. Um, I said that uh, this that space was, of course, quite open, but of course, for the privacy reasons, we had to provide a curtain. And Petra Blaze, uh, uh, basically Rem's partner, designed a curtain. It's a kind of Dutch perspectival drawings, which uh, uh, you know we thought it could be a nice uh, motif for architecture school. But not only for that, but because, as you know, behind this curtain, there's a 15 meter of cantilever, so we thought that the curtain could provide a kind of virtual columns. So this is a dome. Uh, underneath the dome, this is a bridge, as I said, from the entry to the mid-level of the auditorium you can go through. But this is not just made for that, but to observe the crit, crit critique uh, happening from above. Um, the cr this was again an open-ended space which was very difficult to use with multiple groups of uh, reviews. So we made this kind of flexible wall that is attached here. This is a study um, to create a movable kind of uh, hinged wall that allows you to make this kind of undulated wall that you can actually mildly segregate. Or you can actually make one closed room like this. This is a kind of view I like that uh, a lot of people who are waiting for the bus who has nothing to do with architecture can actually uh, look down and see what's happening in architecture school, which of course is not so well exposed at the moment or in general. or you can divide the space into like three simultaneous crit space. So this is uh, how we kind of designed uh, the kind of flexibility of the space, which of course could be used as a kind of big party space too. 
Uh, there are other elements that we designed in the in the building. This is the freight elevator. Uh, obviously, we knew that people make their stuff in the studio, which is upper plate, but go to the B1 level, which is the crit space. And architecture and art, of course, uses a lot of uh, big models. So it's almost like a freight elevator or room itself moving uh, up and down. And again, students started to use this space for the photography for some reason and strange. Um, but you can actually use, uh, because it's kind of consistently cladded with wood, uh, so, but you can see this uh, room moving uh, up and down at the entrance. We also designed the toilet. Uh, as you know, uh, architecture school, you stay very long, uh, I hope. Um, this is a kind of single folded uh, uh, plate so that basically wherever you are, you're next to the different gender. Um, but it's full height. Uh, so you kind of maintain certain tension uh, even in the bathroom. Um, so also the signage was deliberately made kind of ambiguous. So this is the men. So it's a kind of uh, how to say the x y is men and x x is women um, so when you're here not knowing it's very confusing which side to go uh, and even when you're inside it's still confusing but anyway as you can see it's a full height space but you always know that the next to you it's a different gender sorry um, the roof was also utilized to express the kind of our intention uh, and also uh, to provide a consistent natural light. Uh, because it's such a big plate, of course, as fur further you go into the space, darker it gets. So we made the reverse, basically, diagram. As, as uh, deeper you go into the space, the skylight gets bigger. So there's a kind of skylight pattern. Also, the, as you saw initial diagram, there is a kind of art squad, and this is a canyon, the green density and the natural from lawn to kind of more natural uh, setting uh, is basically this building is bridging those two different types of landscape. So we wanted to express that with this kind of gradation from lawn to more lush uh, green. I don't have a good picture because we don't, the green was not uh, grown when we took this photo, but as you can see, the red part will be more lush compared to the green part. It's creating a kind of interesting datum that you can also look down to the gorge. And those are the skylights. Uh, similar to your building, we got the uh, Building of the Year, 2011. Um, and known also a building that went through a kind of very difficult time of uh, economical situation. How much time do I have? All right, that's, that's a lot. I, I just show you a film that the students took and they won an award uh, of the daily life of this building and I would like to end. This is basically a student group filmed it and I think they won an award, not in, the, not in the architectural award, but some kind of real film.
you can see this old facade which I forgot to mention. Thank you. Any questions? I give a lecture at uh, somewhere at the design festival tomorrow at 2. I forgot the location, but I will show something different if you're interested. Uh, thank you, Shohei. Uh, I would like to start by asking uh, sort of how you thought about the fact that architects or future architects will inhabit this building and that you sort of provide a reference point for their sort of almost their entire architectural career. So both when you worked with it and now reflecting on it uh, 10 years later with, with already several uh, generations going through it. Yeah. Um, we actually hire a lot of Cornell students. They are very good. Uh, they have a very good undergrad program, and uh, they o what they always say is that, of course, being in one space, being able to see different generation, different disciplines doing different projects, is very rewarding. Just uh, as a simple fact, um, and uh, I think that. Uh, you know, there's a strange statistics in U.S. that uh, when they are deciding, when they're in high school, when they're deciding which school to go, they decide when they arrive to campus within two minutes or something. So they, the build, the, the, the identity of the building is quite important for the acquisition of good students for the university. So. Uh, in both terms, I heard good stories about it because in Cornell, there aren't so many new buildings in that area. And uh, also, the space is actually quite working quite well. And I think uh, as referring to what I said about being iconic in 2004 or five, this building is very hard to understand, you know, unless it was built. So I'm so glad that a lot of people who had been there is often more appreciative than people who hadn't been. So uh, that's that's uh, kind of um, the situation right now. And I, I'm really glad that the students are, you know, always inventing the usage, new usage of the space. And do you think they learn anything about architecture in this space that they wouldn't somewhere else? I'm sure compared to the <laughs> previous situation, they they can learn something. I mean, um, that, the, the you know, the contrast between new and old or how new can be also difficult or how, you know, um, you know, even the students who were studying during the construction could, you know, they held a special program to really understand the construction so they use the kind of duration of architecture uh, process quite well integrated to the pedagogy of it. And I think that's also something that 
you can hardly experience when you're a student to really go through and witness the actual process. Right? So that was also, I think, rewarding for the school. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. How is the vertical studio, vertical school building? Is it difficult or it's nice? or Because like in Cornell, it's very difficult to hide. You know, like <laughs> Anders, do you have any comments? <laughs> I'm not saying people are hiding. but uh, yeah, we, we actually had a quick uh, uh, tour uh, around the building just before mm -hmm. the lecture. But uh, uh, it is uh, problematic in the sense that you don't go into the uh, individual floors unless you have a reason to do that. So you don't meet necessarily there. Although the years are a little bit mixed, so there's opportunity to to uh, meet. So maybe the build, you know, what happens with the pedago pedagogy in the building, maybe not so much in different buildings, but the way you meet may differ very, very much. And that would only be, I mean, like, um, since there's two stairways, mm -hmm. that also creates a big issue. Big it's issue or big yeah, issue? Yeah, because, I, I mean, since, like, I'm on the fifth floor, mm -hmm. and so I would never, like, meet someone that goes to the f second floor and use the other stairway. Ah, but okay. Otherwise, like, the stairway could be a natural meeting point, but yeah. it's not since it's two. Interesting. Is there identity of the staircase, or it's exactly the same looking? No, it's the same color, same. Yeah. Pretty much identical. Uh, yeah. um, let's see if I can like formulate this question. Um, I I wondered, do you think there might be any problematic aspects in creating a building for architects that it that is in itself very iconic, that it might somehow, you know, uh, create and uh, impress upon us its shapes, its forms, and its uh, its uh, language, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean, are you referring to this building? I, I might, I might actually be referring to this building <laughs> this <laughs> a building. bit, but no, but, but I don't think this building looks iconic per se, but and also so as that one, but it's in certain area it looks quite unusual and I think unusualness is, is for me it's important because after you know graduating I learned a lot how flexible architecture design is so I don't also want to you know put students in imprint to the students that architecture need to be X and Y and Z because it's indeed quite flexible but that doesn't mean that it has to always be formal formally iconic um, we were actually, you know, from the very beginning in the sales pitch to this client, we were saying, oh, this building is not really iconic. It's we are making iconic place, not a building, you know, almost like a plaza uh, of uh, studio space where a lot of interdisciplinary activity happens. So that was our sales <laughs> pitch. And I don't know what was here, but um, I, I don't think actually in during the student time, if you're exposed to a certain um, ideology, either formalism or non-formalism, I think it's anyway valuable. I don't think it's uh, imprints any kind of reaction to, uh, or it, I don't think it limits your future. I think the worst is that when you live in an environment where there's no intention. Anybody else? Last chance. If not, uh, thank you again for thank coming. You. Let me give a hand to the show. Thank you.